Chris Godinez, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon, and then I post it up to Facebook. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, psychology today will pop up, click on that, and it will have qualified therapists in your area. Also, the views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other damn therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka done. Okay, so stuff I wanted to cover before we dive into our topic today about sex in a toxic relationship. Somebody wrote in and said, okay, last week you had a question about how to communicate with kids that are having to go back and forth to the toxic parent. One way we have done it in the past was Alexa, the PS4, so video games, that kind of thing, uh, Facebook Kids Messenger. So I hope that that... Um, helps because I know that that was a question. Um, so yeah, when you're dealing with uh, kids going back and forth, you got to find a way to talk. So I know a lot of parents use video games to talk back and forth when the opposing parent or the other parent is parental interference. So you could try that. Whew, wanted to get that out of the way. Also, next week, I am taking next Sunday off because I have been doing this straight through since about February and I need a break. So I'm going to the fabulous living room Landia, followed by the kitchen table Landia, and then maybe, you know, a spa in the bathroom Landia, and then probably ending up in the bedroom Landia. So that's what I'm going to be doing next week. So no show next Sunday. So um, there's that. Okay. Let's dive into this incredibly big topic. So today's topic, oh, wait, sorry, one other thing. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys, a little scattered today. Um, Susanna Quintana. So Susanna Quintana is your girl. Guys, I cannot counsel people across state lines, and I don't have time for long conversations. I really don't. I have like, you know, I can give you five minutes of my time in between clients because I'm literally seeing between 30 and 40 clients a week. So um, Susanna Quintana at SusannaQuintana.com. That would be the person you can go to because she's a, a narcissistic recovery coach expert. She can go across state lines. She can go across international lines. She's your girl. I can only do people in Arizona. So, and, and you're more than welcome to send me questions and I will answer you as quickly as I can. But if you're expecting a huge, long conversation with me, it's not going to happen because I just, I don't have time, which is also part of the reason why I'm taking a vacation <laughs> next week because I'm tired. So, okay. So Susanna Quintana, her book is You're Still That Girl. It is available in bookstores now. Um, it's also available online from her, SusannaQuintana.com. She's amazing. I love her. If you are going through a divorce, I kid you the fuck not, read this book. Splitting, and it's by Randy Krieger and Bill Eddy. Phenomenal book. Read it so that you know what to expect. Because when you leave an abuser, it is crazy, upside down, oh my God land. Seriously. If you are interested in my books, they are available on Amazon, also on Audible. I do the narration of them because I don't trust anybody else to read my words. So um, it's, uh, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him cha-cha. Why some people stay in abuse and others don't. And this is my autobiography about growing up with a crazy family and how to survive that. So there that is. All right. And um, apparently I have been saying Shahida's name wrong. It's Shahida, not Shahida. I'm so sorry. Not intentional. Um, anyway, her book, amazing, 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 amazing. And her new book is coming out October 20th, I want to say, but go on to Amazon, find out when it is. You can pre-order it. She's amazing. I love her work. She is phenomenal. Okay. Today's topic, sex and sexuality in a toxic relationship. So... <sighs> So when we are raised, I'm going to start with the, the parent stuff and then I'm going to move on to the romantic stuff because I think that would be the easiest way to organize it. When we are raised by crazy toxic parents, okay, like just bat shimomo, nuttier than a fruitcake, holy cow, out of their mind, they give us this warped sense of who we are because they have a warped sense of who they are. So very often when we have got toxic parents, you know, malignant borderline, malignant narcissist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They give us this warped sense of sex and a, this warped sense of our bodies and our warped sense of who we are in this world. Now, in a healthy relationship, let's just make this perfectly clear. In a healthy relationship, sex and sexuality is celebrated. It's like, this is great. I love you. I love the way you express yourself. And this is all good. In a toxic relationship, 
there is no accepting of that. There's always conditions put on it, or there's always this weirdness put on sex and sexuality. So it starts when we're young. If we have parents that are abusive, they will um, they will start twisting our idea of what good is and what sex is and expressing ourselves. So there's a lot of shaming that goes on. And somebody wrote in asking about that. Can you please talk about the sex shaming from toxic parents? Uh, namely using religion to teach children that sex is bad as a way to control the narrative. Yes, absolutely. So um, when you're dealing with a communal narcissist, especially if you notice, if you watch all of the communal narcissists behaviors, right? Or if you study up on them, Jim Jones, uh, the guy who did the Kota tech or whatever that comment was where everybody chopped their genitals off. Um, you know, uh, Koresh, David Koresh, uh, you know, all of these communal narcissists, what is the first thing they start controlling? Who's having sex with who and who can express sex and who can express sex. So it's all very sexually warped in the mind of the narcissist. And so it starts when the parents are abusive and they are malignant, borderline malignant narcissist, and they start shaming the child about their bodies and about expressing sex, et cetera, et cetera. Show me a narcissistic parent, show me a malignant borderline, and I will show you somebody that is going to use that to control their child. Absolutely. So kids get the message, you know, don't touch yourself. It's bad. It's wrong. Your, your body is evil. Your body is ugly. I can't tell you the number of survivors that have that stuck in their heads. And it's no wonder we end up with body issues, you know, you know, either, you know, eating too much, not eating enough, not exercising, not taking care of ourselves, not really loving our own bodies because we get this shaming from the family of origin. So this is, people are so funny. They're always like, and I get this from clients and I get this from you guys too. It's like, well, does working on the inner child really help? Yes, because we've got this stuff that we're not even aware of until it becomes obvious that it's a problem. And so one of the problems that they give us is this body shaming, this sex shaming, this uh, you're not okay and I need to warp you because I'm not okay, but I'm not going to tell you that I'm not okay, so I'm just going to warp you. So there's a lot of shaming that goes on as far as sex is concerned, and they use religion. Absolutely, 110%. So the communal narcissists are the more likely ones to do that, but non-communal narcissists do that as well, but not to the degree that communal narcissists do. So like I said, if you study any of these cults, right, the first thing they do is they can tr control who's with who, who has sex with who, if you're even having sex, if you're being asked to mutilate yourself, if you're asked, you, do you see where I'm going with that? So there's a lot of body shaming that goes on in a toxic family. And we get the idea very early on that it's not okay to have those feelings. Lord, let's take that a step further. Let's say you come out, you just, you realize, you know, you're coming out, you're, you're gay, right? Those parents are the ones that abandon their kids. They are the ones that shame them for being gay or being trans or, you know, LBGTQ. They shame them, shame them, shame them, shame them. And they're the ones that kick them out. And it, it, mm. I dislike them intensely. I just want you to know that because that pisses me right the fuck off. You love your kid no matter what but they don't have children for the right reason. And we'll talk about that because this all has to do with sex. So, okay. So they can't handle a kid being genuine and authentic. So when a child is, you know, comes out, realizes, okay, I'm gay, I'm trans, I'm, you know, whatever is going on. This is who I am. This is how I'm going to express myself. They come unglued. Why? Because the kid's being authentic. The kid's being genuine. The kid's being real. And that person cannot handle it. And so this is where you get the parents that try to do the um, the conversion therapy, which is illegal. Thank you very much. At least it should be if it's not in your state. It is, I believe, illegal here in Arizona. And I know it's illegal in California. And I think it's actually illegal in all but maybe a handful of states. So anyway, they're the ones that push the conversion therapy. They're also the ones that do the shaming, the blaming, the guilt tripping, kicking the kid out of the house, uh, forcing them. Oh, forcing them to date somebody that they're not attracted to ever, you know, in order to make them conform to their idea of what normal is for them. 
And honestly, you show me abusers very often, they are just homophobic, probably because they have unexpressed thoughts that they've never dealt with. The more homophobic somebody is, I can guarantee you they're, they're having thoughts that they have not dealt with. And so they reject it and then they are hateful about it. So anyway, yes, this all goes back to the shaming, the blaming, the guilting for us as human beings coming from a dysfunctional toxic family. Okay. So we get this bad body image going on, right? So now let's transfer this over to, okay, now we're in a relationship with, with one of these narcissists, right? So what we've done is our inner child, because we haven't worked on this stuff, our inner child has looked outside and went, oh, there's somebody that kind of sort of reminds me of mom, dad, grandparents, whoever the problem was. I'm going to make them love me. If I can make them love me, I prove these people wrong, right? So I make this stranger out here love me. I prove my family of origin wrong. Half of a shit sandwich, half of a shit sandwich, total shit sandwich. So then we get involved with a narcissist, right? A malignant narcissist, a malignant borderline psychopath, whatever. So what they do, as far as sex is concerned, what they do is they take what they know we're, sensitive about right like so if we came from a family that shamed us about our body at first they're going to be like oh no you're beautiful you're handsome you're this you're that mirroring right you're 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 everything i wanted you're this you're that as soon as the mask drops and they start showing them their real selves they start criticizing your sexuality they start criticizing how much you have sex, how little you have sex, whether or not you're enjoying the sex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's used to manipulate control. So it's kind of like what I've seen them do, and, and it goes both ways. And we're going to talk about the opposite side of the coin, because remember, <laughs> same coin, flip side. So what I've seen them do is you're a sexual being, okay? You've, you've, you enjoy sex, you, you want to express your sexuality, you want to be with your partner, you want to give them physical love, etc. What they'll do is they'll start shaming you for it. You're a whore, you're a slut, you're this, you're that, you're, you're oversexed, you're, you're an octopus, you're blah, 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 blah. And you start questioning whether or not the amount of sex that you want is healthy. <sighs> they do this intentionally. They want you to feel less than. They want you to doubt yourself. They want you to not love who you are. And sexuality is, and the amount of sex for each person is individual. You know, some people are, you know, happy with once a week. Other people are like, dear Lord, I need it at least every other day. Other people are like, oh, I'm okay with once a month. You know, it depends. Sexuality is an individual thing. Okay. But what the narcissist does is that whichever way you're going with that, they're going to make you wrong, basically. So they love to be like, oh, 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 here's the big one. Whew, and I was thinking about this when I was getting ready this morning. So what they do to both men and women, and I want to make this very, very clear because I had a couple of trolls be like, oh, you hate men. No, I don't. If you listen to me, I'm constantly going, yeah, women do this too. Yeah, they can be abusers too. Hello. What they do, and both men and women abusers do this, okay? They do this whole saint whore, saint whore thing. And they do this with men and women, okay? So it's like the Madonna whore syndrome. So the Madonna whore syndrome is, is that you're either, because remember, this is splitting, guys. Remember how disordered people cannot handle a plethora of emotions, right? They can't handle the grays. They can't handle the different colors, so this is splitting. So the, the Madonna whore syndrome is where the person that they are fantasizing about having this perfect picture about or whatever it is they're doing is literally perfect. Like, like the Madonna syndrome is where the, the woman usually, but guys get, guys get the daddy version of this, put up on a pedestal. They're perfect. They don't, they don't make a mistake. They're, they're, they're saints. They're, they're unsexual unsexual. I don't even know if that's a word, but you know what I mean? It's like, they're not sexual. They're the mother. They're the, the, the mother or the father. Right. And then the flip side of that coin is you're a slut, you're a whore, you're a gigolo, you're this, you're that, you're the other thing. Right. So it's like, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. And this is what narcissists do. They do this splitting thing where you're either a whore because you like sex or you have to be Madonna because you're not having sex at all. And you have to be this like, you know, beautific, kind of person. No. So it, it's, 
it's crazy. It's crazy. And men get done, get, get done this. They do. They get put through this as well. It's just not called the Madonna whore syndrome. I'm not even sure what we would call it, but it's like, they get through this, you know, no, you have to be the daddy. You have to be the daddy or you have to be, you know, this good to go. The second I want sex kind of thing. And that's the crazy thing. It's like, remember narcissists, malignant narcissists, malignant borderlines, malignant, you know, obviously psychopaths, we have no more meaning to them than this spray bottle. Seriously, we are objects. And so you get people that will, you know, these abusers that are like, no, you have to be able to perform on my command. Who does that? Like nobody I know. So it's really crazy and it's really weird. And again, the person is not looked at as a whole human being. They are looked at as an object. So we become object objectified by the narcissist, by the borderline, by the psychopath, by whoever is doing the abusing. Whew. And it's just crazy. So the other thing that these people do is that if they, hmm, when they want to manipulate and control, and when, if they really want to get you where you live, they start making fun of your sexuality in public, in public. And they will put all of the problems that, you might be having sexually with them as your fault, but they'll tell anyone who will listen. It is the most horrible thing to have to sit through and listen to, you know, cause you're just sitting there watching this person going, do you understand that nobody is socializing or sympathizing with you right? or socializing sympathizing with you right now because we see what you're doing. Wow. Crazy. Hello. So they drag up all their sexual dirty laundry. You know, you'll be out to dinner, you know, and this person will just start going off on their partner's inability to get it up or their partner's inability to orgasm or their partner's, you know, whatever. So they use anything as a form of humiliation and they usually do it publicly. Why? Because they're crazy. And it's a way to put the person one down and keep them under their thumb so that they can continue to manipulate and control. <sighs> okay, hold on. There was another question I wanted to make sure I answered because people were writing in going, okay, can you talk about how even the good sex can be bad when it's used to keep us sweet or to throw us a bone or to keep the abuse routine? It took me ages to see this in hindsight. Okay, this is the one thing I get a lot from my clients is, but 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 the sex is so good. Flip side, same coin, guys. Flip side, same coin. So sometimes the sex is just amazing, right? And that's how they keep us hooked because it's the intermittent positive reward. So, but what they'll do is they'll dribble and drabble it. You know, they'll be the ones that are unavailable. They'll be the ones that, you know, don't have time. I have to leave. I've got a, you know, a job trip. I got whatever. So yeah, they do. And oftentimes what I see these abusers do is they hook their partner with the promise of great sex. So you get together with them. They're mirroring you. They find out that you're a sensual being. You enjoy sex. Okay, great. They come in. You guys have got great sex going on. But as soon as the mask slips, boop, the sex dries up. It does. Or they use the sex as the stick in the carrot. You know, it's kind of like, okay, I'll, I'll give you sex if kind of thing. So it, it, it's really weird <laughs> the way they do this. And it's dysfunctional. That's not a healthy, normal relationship. A healthy, normal relationship is you are having sex with somebody because you enjoy it and you enjoy your partner and you laugh and you have fun and you're talking and communicating. Oftentimes with the narcissist, it's like this weird, I don't even know how to describe or explain it, but it's like this weird thing. It has to be perfect and it has to be silent and it has to have no fun and it has to be serious, serious, you know, it's like, whoa, what's the point? So um, yeah, they do that. So let me see, I wanted to make sure and hit that because I thought that was really important too. So yeah, they do use the sex, good sex as a way of keeping us stuck. Okay, talked about the shaming. Porn. Let's talk about porn. Okay. So the other thing that abusers will do is during the mirroring phase, right? Oh, I'm this honest, upstanding, saintly person. I respect everybody, blah, 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 blah. But you know, the fake compassion, I think I talked about that a few months ago, fake compassion, how they're faking, faking, faking. And then 
it turns out, no, they're doing porn all the time. And then your sex life starts drying up because they're getting their needs met through porn. So again, why, 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 why is it that narcissists are typically the ones that turn to porn and stay with porn and have porn addictions? Because the porn is this bottle. It's an object to be used. The people performing the porn to them are not real people which is why we have this huge trafficking issue in the entire world. What the fuck? So yeah, because the people in those movies, in those movies, see, <laughs> tapes, whatever, tapes, see, I'm old. Oh my God. But you know, whatever they're using, the, the, the medium that they're using have no more meaning to them than this bottle. It's, it's, they, they're not real to them. They are, we're not real to them. So for them, they don't see a problem with it. And so when you call the partner on the porn addiction and say, hey, this isn't healthy, especially if they start demanding or expecting your sex life to mimic what's going on in the pornos, that's not reality, guys. That is so not reality. I can't even begin to tell you how much not reality that is. When I lived in LA, I had a girlfriend that did the editing for a lot of the porn houses in the San Fernando Valley. And she would tell me exactly what was going on. They had fluffers. They had somebody that would go in in between sets and fluff up the mail. And then they would shoot the thing and they would, yeah, it's, it's not based in reality at all. And most of the women in those situations, some of the guys too, had been groomed, had been abused, had been in the trafficking issues, and that's how they got into the porno industry. So it's, it, mm, don't get me started. It's a problem. It's a problem. So if they start demanding that you start acting like one of the porno stars, it's not going to happen. That's not reality. That is, that is so not reality. But remember, narcissists are invested in the fantasy. They are invested in this, you know, it has to be perfect and it has to be like Hollywood and it has to be like this porno and it has to be this and it has to be that. So, and it's also impersonal. So if they're getting their jollies off from watching porn, it's completely impersonal. There's no human interaction there. There's no emotions. Remember, they don't do emotions. They don't know how to do emotions. They don't want to do emotions. And they make you wrong for having the emotions, which is why they make us wrong for being sexual. Because guess what? Good sex generally involves good emotions. So yeah, so they, they have this weird thing about porn, almost always, almost always. So there is that. I want to make sure I covered all of these questions that I got on this because I think this is really important. Important. Wait a minute. Three. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. Um, okay. Exhibitionism. Okay. Yes. All right. So a lot of times narcissists will definitely be exhibitionists. They'll want you to do sexual acts in public. They'll want you to, um, you know, dress scantily in public. They'll want, you know, or they'll want something where they can be caught kind of thing. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of weird behavior with these people. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you want to trust your gut, guys. If you're in a relationship with somebody and it's impersonal, even if the sex is like mechanically great, if it's missing that soul connection or that laughter or that fun or that joy or that, you know, whatever, then trust your gut. Something is off because in a good relationship, you don't need an audience. You need the two of you talking, laughing, having fun, cuddling, figuring out what sexually each of you like, et cetera, et cetera. That's what a good relationship is. It's, it's, it's finding out who the other partner is and really enjoying the other partner and talking each other's love language and figuring out each other's sexual love language and having fun with that. Narcissists don't do that. They couldn't care less what our sexual love language is. They really can't. They really don't. And so, you know, they're the ones that like, you know, don't care about their partner's feelings. Oftentimes, oh, this is another one. Holy cow, so much ground to cover. So oftentimes they will engage in BDSM behavior, which, you know, in and of itself, not a bad thing. Just want to make that perfectly clear. However, they're sadists and they will hurt their partner intentionally. And oops, oh no, I was just kidding. Oops. Oh no, that was an accident. Oops. You know, that wasn't what I meant. You know, they're sadists guys. They like inflicting pain. They like to hurt people because they're fucking assholes. So you've got to be very, very careful about what's happening in your life. If, if you're with somebody and they're continually 
hurting you and it's not what you wanted. And, and it's always, oh, oh, that was a mistake. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. You know, and it happens more than once or twice, then yeah, you've got Houston, you got a problem. So that is something to think about. Um, so they shame us for having our own sexuality. They shame us for coming out. They shame us for, uh, wanting sex they shame us for not wanting sex they basically shame i think here is the common denominator is what i'm trying to say so there's a whole bunch of shame 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 going on um okay i think huh, was there something else i wanted to cover so oh oh that's the other thing oh my god so they'll want their partner to engage in threesomes or some other form of sex that the partner does not want okay remember good sex is consensual guys everybody's on the same page it's all good you know but what the abuser will do is they will want you to engage in a threesome or an orgy or something and they want to film it that's part of that exhibitionism so they want to film it but there's a couple of reasons why they want to film it one is because obviously it's a turn on for them. And some of them enjoy the idea of watching the partner being, you know, having sexual relations with somebody else. But the other reason they do it, and I have seen this multiple times is that is then used as black male. They do. So they don't necessarily publish it because that's called revenge porn. And you can go to jail for that, which I think is awesome. But what they do is they use the fear of it. Oh, I'll just accidentally let this slip if you don't fill in the blank. So yeah, you'd be very careful about a partner that's always wanting you to do things that you wouldn't do are not comfortable doing. And then, you know, keeping the evidence as it were, because they'll use it later. It's they still do that. It still happens. Revenge porn still happens. And it is a federal offense. It is illegal. They will go to jail. So, you know, the thing of it is, is that they, they build on that shame that we have inside of us. And they count on that to keep us from going, fuck you, asshole. No, fucking show whoever you want, you dickwad. Do you see where I'm going with that? So yeah, it's, it's, that is something else that they do. If somebody is asking you to perform a sexual act that you're not comfortable with, you have the right to say no. And you have the right to say, no, I don't want to be filmed. You do. And if they film you and then try to use it, you get an attorney and you go after them and you prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. You absolutely do. You do. We do not negotiate with terrorists, motherfucker. Uh -uh, no way. But that's what they do. They, they are counting on the shame to keep us compliant basically is what it is. Okay. Let's see. I'm trying to make sure I've covered everything I wanted to talk about. So essentially they hook us with the sex, especially if they recognize that we're a sensual sexual human being and we enjoy it. So they'll hook us with that and then they'll dry it up or they'll try to get us to do things that we don't want to do, or they'll try to tape us or the whatever they make us wrong for wanting whatever amount of sex that we want. You know, they'll tell us all sorts of horrible things about ourselves. They're lying basically. Um, they, they use shame like nobody's business, especially if we'd been groomed by parental units to already feel shameful about our own sexuality, our own bodies, et cetera, et cetera. They will work on that. It's like a wound that they just jam their finger into and they just, ah, 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 and they want it to bleed. So yeah, they do that as well. Okay. I think, I hope I covered everything that I needed to with this topic. Cause it's, it's a big thing. This is what abusers do in part to control. It's about control. It's about power and control. It is not about love. It is not about real real sexuality. It's not. It's about their need to maintain power and control and have something over us to keep us down, to make us feel bad, to shame us, et cetera, et cetera. It's just another game for them. So it, <laughs> remember how I was talking about um, Stockholm syndrome? So this is part of it. This is another trauma bonding that they do. So listen to me now, believe me later. If your partner is making you wrong about sex. You're, you're an octopus. You're too sexual. You're too this, you're too, or not enough or whatever. And they're shaming you for your sex. That is trauma bonding, especially if they were, you know, loving and kind and wonderful and this, that, and then the mass drops and then they start the trauma bonding. Then they take it away. That's trauma bonding. So this is yet another tactic that they trauma bond us with. So, and, and it's hard to see. It's, 
it's hard to see when you when you're in the middle of it you don't see it it's like being in the middle of the forest and going uh i can't see the way out because there's so many trees kind of got to get up on that bluff and look down and go oh there's the path okay now i see it so it's really hard to see when we're in the middle of it because it's so shocking when they do the flip and when the mask comes off and they're like, Oh, you're, you're disgusting. You're, you're, you're too sexual. You're not sexual enough. You're, you know, why do you like that? Why do you smell that way? Why do you, Oh, they do. Oh my God. Some of the things I have heard that the abusers have told their partners, male and female. Okay. Horrific. Just the way to make the person feel less than. So they attack the way they smell. They attack the way they taste. They attack the way they, they kiss. They attack the way they have sex. They attack, the, you know, <laughs> it's a way to control and it is trauma bonding. It absolutely is. So if they come off one way in the beginning and now all of a sudden they're doing the polar opposite, congratulations, they are trauma bonding you. They are doing the intermittent positive rewards with sex. So remember they do it with money. They do it with emotions. They do it with sex. They do it with sex. So I really hope that that really makes it clear. And, and I want you guys to go back and maybe write out your relationship sexually with your abuser and see how they did that intermittent positive rewards. I love you. I love you. I love you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Love, hate, love, hate, love, hate. Giving you sex, not giving you sex. You're too much. You're not enough. Blah, blah, blah. That's all trauma bonding. That's all trauma bonding. It's all about sex, but it's all about trauma bonding. Okay. Let's hit the questions. Cause I'm pretty sure you guys are going to have a whole bunch of questions for me. Uh, my ex shamed me for being too sexual. Ooh, She used to be sexual, but changed after three years. She said she didn't know if she was sexually attracted to me anymore. How do I stop obsessing about it? Get with a good trauma therapist. This has nothing to do with you and everything to do with her. So, you know, I've been married to John for low these good Lord, 26 years, 20, 26 years. I think it's 26 years. Um, and we've been together for longer than that. I'm still sexually attracted to him. I always will be. Why? Cause we have fun together and we're not cuckoo for cocoa puffs. At least I don't think so. So, you know, it, it's, it's not you, it's her. So get with a good trauma therapist and work on letting this go. This is not about you. Write it out, write it out. You know, when did this happen? What happened? How did this happen? How did you feel about it? Did you feel manipulated? What was going on? Get with a good trauma therapist. Absolutely. So part of it is, is that they attack us on this very basic level. You know, one nastier thing to say to somebody other than, you know, I'm not sexually attracted to you. After having been with that person sexually for, you know, three, four, 10, 20 years, you know, that's a pretty nasty thing to do. You know, instead of taking responsibility and going, you know what, I, I'm just not, I'm not there. It's not you. It's me. We're just not working out. And, you know, I'm going to go work on me and you go work on you and I wish you well. Right. That's what a mature person would do. But inevitably, the narcissist, the borderline, the psychopath, you, 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 you guns. It's your fault. It's you. It's you. It's you. So yeah, so there's that. So get with a good trauma therapist, write this all out, really put it back on that. Um, I would also, again, CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving, Pete Walker, chapter three, put it back on the abuser, put it back on the abuser. It's not yours. It's not your luggage. Put it back. So yeah. All right. Um, and there is no such thing as being too sexual unless you've got a sex addiction, which generally... A lot of narcissists do have sex addiction. So they, I worked with one client. Oh my God, this was years ago. This was like 20 years ago almost. Holy shit. Yeah. Like 15 years ago. Um, this one client was a sex addict, was having sex to the point that the nerves were getting damaged, had to send him to a specialist. And yeah, there was all sorts of family issues going on. So, I mean, that is a thing. Sex addiction is a thing and it is generally in disordered people. So but when usually when the narcissist or the borderline says you're too sexual, it means that you're having a normal idea of what sex is, you know, anywhere between one and three times a week or more, you know, four times a week, five times a week, and they'll make you wrong for it. So, um, yeah, get with a good trauma therapist, work on that. Okay. Which book, um, that you recommend should I start reading to heal from narcissistic exes and toxic family of origin that inner child workbook? Is that the preferred order? There's really no good order, guys. I get this question a lot. It really depends on what is up for you and what you want to start working on. So with the inner child workbook, it 
is going to trigger you. It is going to be working on your family of origin, what you were thinking, what you were feeling, the mistaken thoughts, the mistaken beliefs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it can be very triggering. The CPTSD from surviving to thriving, that too can be triggering because again, cognitively we're working on mistaken thoughts, mistaken beliefs, all of this. The inner child workbook is kind of more working on it somatically. And then the CPTSD book is working on it kind of cerebrally, you know, cognitive thinking. Um, I like starting off with, the self-esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi, because yeah, that can be triggering too. If we've gotten the message, no, 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 it's not okay to be liking myself. It's not okay to have good self-esteem. Oh my gosh, I'm arrogant. I'm, I'm narcissistic. If I say nice things to myself, and we got those messages from our family that too can be triggering, but I find that that one's probably the least triggering of all the books. Um, so really it's what do you want to start on. Some people start with the codependency books. Some people start with the disease to please by Harriet Breaker, or they start with the PM Melody books, or they start with uh, Melanie Beattie, uh, codependent no more beyond codependent no more. So um, it just depends on what is up for you. If you're finding yourself super codependent, maybe that's the way to start. If you want to work on your self-esteem first, so that you've got, you know, a little bit of something to back you up while you're doing all of this heavy lifting, Self-Esteem Workbook by Glenn Schiraldi. If you are ready to dive into the family of origin stuff and start dealing with that, then I would say the Inner Child Workbook by Katherine Taylor, or uh, you could read The Body Keeps Score by uh, Bessel van der Kolk. I love Bessel van der Kolk. Oh my God, great book. So, because we do, we store stuff in our body and it comes out somatically, it comes out body-wise. So um, it just depends on where you are and what you want to work on. And if you're getting too triggered. So what I often recommend to people, it's like, if one book is really, really triggering you and you're having a hard time getting through it, just put the book down, start in on another book and see how that one goes. And then if you can get through that book, go back to the one that was triggering you or take a break and switch between two books. Some people can't do that. Some people are like, no, I need to focus in on one book. So start a book. And if you're having a trouble getting through it, because a lot of people are telling me, oh my God, I read the first paragraph and I'm in tears. Take a deep breath. Maybe we should work on a different book. Pick one. Doesn't matter. Whichever one you want to start working on. But then go back to it. The biggest mistake we make is our inner child freaks out and goes, oh, my God, I'm going to remember and I don't like it. It is painful. And oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Take a deep breath. You've already survived. You've already survived. You made it. You're here. You're, 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 you're in this group listening to each other and talking to me. You made it. You survived. Little one, you survived. It's okay. I got your back. We're just going to have memories. That's it. Are they going to hurt? Mm, probably. But it's okay. And we need to get through this so that we don't keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different outcome. we got to fix our picture. Comfort your inner child. Write your inner child a love letter. Tell them how amazing they are, how great they are, that they survived. Thank you for getting me through to adulthood. Wow, good job. Do you see where I'm going with that? So just pick a book and start and see how it goes. And if it's triggering, put it down. Go to another book, start that one, and try to get through it. Like I said, it depends. It just depends. It depends on where the damage was. It depends on how much you remember. It depends on what you're working on. It depends on a whole bunch of stuff. So it's kind of up to you. And I kind of let my clients decide what they're going to work on. I give them the plethora of books and go, okay, here's everything that's going to help you. Which one do you want to work on first? And then I let them choose because the thing with us coming out of an abusive relationship is we need to have our own agency back and it feels good to be able to go, I'm going to work on this. And then if it doesn't work out, okay, that one was too much. I'm going to try this now, <laughs> you know, and that's okay. It's okay. It's a process. It is. Don't make yourself wrong. So whichever one you want to start working on any and or all of them, because all of them bring stuff up, you know, even the inner child or the um, self-esteem workbook, if you had a lot of messages about, no, it's not okay. No, you can't like yourself. No, you can't like your body. No, you can't like yourself. You can't like this, that, or the other thing. Then when you start working on that, boy, howdy, is this inner critic going to pop up and go, blah, 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 and you're going to have to be like, thank you for your input. Shut the fuck up. Why? Because you say so. I say so. You say so. I am the boss of you. You are not the boss of me. I get to like myself. Why? Because I say so, asshole. See where I'm going with that? So it's everything... All of them bring stuff up. It just depends on your tolerance. So gentle, gentle with you. If you're getting stuck though, if you're going through book after book after book and going, oh, nope, too triggering. Oh, nope, too triggering. Oh, nope, too triggering. Get with a good trauma therapist. That means that you need somebody to help you 
work through this. So you're not alone. Sometimes what my clients will do is they'll bring the book in and we'll work it together in the session, you know, bring the book in. Jesus Christ. I haven't actually been in my office since fucking March, but you know what I'm saying? So like online, we'll like, they'll bring the book to the table and we'll sit there and we'll read it. And you know, well, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Where do you feel this in your body? What's going on? Da, 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 da. You know, we'll work through it. So, so there's that. I hope that was helpful. That was kind of a long explanation. Sorry. Um, if you meet someone you believe to be your soulmate, is that trauma bonding being triggered within you? It can be. Um, it can be, but not always, because sometimes you just meet somebody and they click, right? So you just got to be careful of the um, mirroring and, and actions. So here's the biggest thing. A true soulmate does not drop a mask, okay? A true, true soulmate is truly your friend, okay? And there is no game playing. There is no bullshit. There is no... Um, uh, trauma bonding. There is no trauma bonding. They don't, it's consistency. So what you're looking for in a relationship in a healthy relationship is consistency. The person is consistent. They are consistent. They are consistently who they are. Whereas with a narcissist, it's all over the board. It's like one day they're nice. The next day they're terrible. They're snarky to the wait staff. They're, you know, refusing to go to therapy there, you know, whatever. So you're looking for consistent, you're looking for consistency, and you're looking for respect. So again, do your list of deal breakers. What are your list of deal breakers? What will you not put up with? I did a video on that a few weeks ago. What will you not put up with in any relationship? Disrespect, name calling, abuse, uh, lying, cheating, stealing, um, you know, gaslighting, rewriting history, none of that. And if this person is respectful to you and their actions are consistent and you feel like they're your soulmate, then you're good to go. If their actions are not consistent, if they're all over the place, if they say one thing and do another, then no. So it's kind of trust your gut. Do not listen to your head. Do not listen to your heart. These two guys tell stories, right? Ask them a question and it will be all over the place. Well, yes, but, and this, that, and the other thing, what if this, and blah, 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 blah. But if you ask your gut... Yes or no? Is this person for me? Yes or no? Boom. You'll get an answer and it'll be calm and there's no story. So start practicing talking to your gut. Okay. Um, is BDSM an abnormal sexual behavior? No, no, it's not. It's, it's just a way that people express themselves. So there's nothing abnormal about it. The only time I would be concerned about BD, BDSM is if they were doing something permanently harmful, permanently damaged to themselves or others then it's, then it's a problem. So, um, okay. Why do the abusers guilt their spouses for not giving them enough sexual attention saying that they deserve it because they do so much for the spouse because it's a guilt trip. So remember, listen to me now, believe me later, any relationship, any relationship that has fear, obligation, or guilt is not a healthy relationship. That's the fog. And so they use that to manipulate, control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and especially if they're, if they're guilting their spouses in public, that's huge because this is, this is now, this is a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like a, it's like a show. They're doing it for show. They're doing it to, you know, gain sympathy or whatever. Um, if they're doing it in private, then that's when you need to really go, okay, stop. We need to go to therapy because this is not okay. I'm not going to be guilt tripped into this. Let's, let's go to therapy. And if they won't go to therapy, well, there's your answer. Narcissists do not like therapy. Here's the deal. When they do agree to go to therapy, they usually want to be the one to pick the therapist. Why? Because they will pick an LAC as opposed to an LPC. An LAC is a licensed associate counselor. Those are the ones that are still going through and getting their permanent license. They have not gotten their permanent license yet. They're not experienced. An LPC has gone through the 3,000, 36,000 million hours. I think it was 3,600 when I went through. And, you know, gotten the experience and knows how to deal with this, hopefully. Um, so they try to find somebody that is not experienced in, in narcissism. And or if they do go to therapy, they literally will go like one to three times. And then when the therapist goes, and what's your part of it? They go, fuck you, you're incompetent. And they walk out. So that's just what they do. Um, okay. So I hope that answered that question. Uh, if friends talk about kinks and such in front of you and they continue doing so after you've said you're uncomfortable, is that a deal breaker? Yeah, absolutely. So 
remember, this is part of respect. And this is a boundary. This is a boundary. If you don't want to hear it, then you don't need to hear it. So one of the biggest things, oh, I forgot to say this. One of the other things that abusers do that I would just like to send all of them into space without oxygen on is they will tell their children the sexual stuff between them and their ex. And they will be like, poor me, your mom wouldn't have sex with me, your dad wouldn't have sex with me, blah, 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 blah. And they're telling the kids this. Sweet baby Jesus. <sighs> so inappropriately sharing sexual stuff is a boundary issue. You never involve the children in your sexual life. You don't. They don't want to hear it. Trust me on that. You know, it's <sighs> they don't want to hear it. And, and, and if you're dealing with a friend that's doing that and you've said, Hey, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I really, this is a boundary. I don't want to hear it. And they continue to do it. Then that's a deal breaker because they're crossing a boundary. They're not respecting you. That is huge. And you've got to be careful of that. So people that do not respect boundaries, there's an issue. Does that make sense? So yeah, that's a deal breaker, right? Your list of deal breakers. That's a, that's a boundary breaker. That is a respect issue. They are not respecting you. Now, if it happens once and you go, hey, I'm really not comfortable. Oops, sorry. And then they don't do it again. Great. If they do it twice, you got to kind of question. It's like, okay, I've already told you I'm not comfortable with this. And if they do it three times, you got a pattern. Be done. Be done. Absolutely. After so much sexual abuse since childhood, is it possible that all my relationships or sex were just trauma bond and that I don't really like men? Can one like men after a lot of sexual abuse? Yeah, you can. Absolutely. Um, I would strongly suggest getting with a trauma therapist and working this through. You know, um, a lot of times when we've been abused by a member of either one of the sexes, we end up not liking the entire sex of those people because we were so abused by them, but that may or may not be who we are. So when we come out of an abusive relationship or multiple abusive relationships, we've lost who we are. We don't know who we are because the abuse has shaded, literally hidden us from who we are. And so it's a matter of really exploring who are we, you know, are we, are we attracted to men? Are we attracted to women? What are we doing? Where are we in life? What's the deal? Is this because, you know, am I feeling this way because of the abuse? Am I generalizing? Am I, am I villainizing an entire gender because of my abusers being men? What's the deal? So I would say get with a really good trauma therapist and work this through. This is common. You're not alone. A lot of people coming out of especially childhood trauma, sexual abuse, etc., have those feelings. And it's really important to work those out to figure out what you want, not what your trauma wants, not what your family wants, not what anybody else wants. What do you want? So get with a good trauma therapist and start working through that. I think that's really important. Um, how does one who's been extremely promiscuous and watched so much pornography work on becoming innocent again and erasing those images? Okay, so when somebody has had a sex addiction and they get addicted to pornography, it really screws with your version in your head of how normal sex is. And it becomes almost like you cannot attain orgasm unless it is this kind of extreme pornographic thing, right? Hang on. So it's going to be a matter of working on, okay, first of all, why? Why were you extremely promiscuous? What happened? It's, it's not normal, quote unquote, for people to just suddenly become pr extremely promiscuous, and especially when they're younger. It's like, who groomed you? What's going on? What did you see? What did you hear? What's going on? Why did you get into pornography? What was happening? You know, working on all of that. And sometimes that has to do with family of origin. So in a lot of abuse cases, you know, DCS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, there, the abuser will encourage the kid to watch porn, you know, or they'll get them drinking alcohol with them as a way to bond with them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so then that screws that images up for the kids. So I would say get with a really good therapist. Work through all of this. Why? Why were you extremely promiscuous? Why were you watching so much pornography? What was going on? Was it family of origin of issues? Were you groomed? What was happening? You know, and work on self-esteem. The Self-Esteem Workbook by Glenn Schiraldi. And then you have to start associating 
you're, you're never going to erase the images. Those are always going to be there. They just are. But you got to stop watching the porn. It's just like with any addiction. The best way to overcome it is to go cold turkey. Because if you don't, it's always there, right? And so you want to start working on, well, what is normal? What is normal sex? What What is, you know, not the Hollywood version, not the porn version, not my abuser's version, none of that. What is normal sex? And I would say get with a good therapist that is well versed, well trained in sexual abuse, in trauma, and start working through all of that and figure out the how, what, why, when, where, how, and then start learning what healthy sex is. So there's that. Um, how do I tell the difference between rumination and processing? Okay, rumination is like a cow chewing its cud. Uh, here's my country roots are coming out again. So cows have two stomachs and they'll chew their cud. So in other words, they'll bring up some hay or whatever from grass, whatever, and they'll just sit there and, and they'll do that for days and it's disgusting. Um, so rumination is where you just chew it over and chew it over and chew it over and, chew, and it never goes away. That's rumination. And there's always a sense of coulda, shoulda, woulda with that. I could have done that. I should have done that. I would have done that. A little bit of shame. You know, there's other weird, you know, stuff going on. With processing, there's like this distance where you can be like, okay, this happened and this happened. I said this, they did that, and I did that. And if I could do it again, I would probably do this. Okay, that's what I'm going to do next time. Okay, I got a plan. Boom, done. Bye. Done. Like it's done. Like you, you processed it, you figured out a plan and you're done. Rumination is just chewing it over, over and over and over and it never goes away and there's no resolution. So ruminating is where it becomes like an obsession. So that's the best way to, to, to make the differentiation, differentiation, different. The difference between those two is that rumination is like an obsession. Processing is you process it, you figure out what you did wrong or what you want to do differently. You put that into action and then you put it to bed. And it's done. Rumination just keeps going and 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 going. And going. So yeah, that's the difference. Uh, is it common for someone with BPD to blame, punish, and play the victim in everything in life? Yes. So when somebody has malignant uh, borderline personality disorder, so there are different types. So there's the quiet borderlines that are down at the lower end of the spectrum. Generally, they harm themselves. They don't really harm other people. Um, then they move a little further down the line, right? So you've got, uh, you've got the waif, you've got the witch, you've got the queen. Um, so they like to play the victim. They absolutely do. There's different types, right? And, and they move between the types depending on what serves them. But it's usually when they reach malignancy that they start doing this. Um, they love to play the victim. They love to be uh, blaming, shaming, punishing, cold shoulder, stonewalling, et cetera. But here's the other thing. It's not just BPD that does this. It's also the uh, covert narcissists that do this. Covert narcissists love to play the victim. Poor me. You never, you never write. You never cool. It's, you know, you did this, you, 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 punish, 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 punish. So in those re respects, BPD and covert narcissism are similar. So when they get to like that point where they're now malignant, all of the um, personality disorders start actually mimicking each other. They start looking like each other because so many of the behaviors are so dysfunctional that they share them kind of thing. So uh, it's common for uh, BPD to do that. It's also common for covert narcissists to do that as well. Um, if I could pick four workbooks, what would they be? Well, shit, it depends on the situation. Like I said, um, I love the self-esteem workbook. I think everybody could benefit from good self-esteem. I also love the disease to please by Harriet Breaker, because I honestly think that we need to work on boundaries and stop being people pleasers because we were trained to be people pleasers. Um, the other two books, it depends. If you had trauma, a lot of trauma growing up with a family, CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving, Pete Walker, and then piggybacking off of that, Inner Child Workbook by Katherine Taylor. So but then I also like the um, Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. It, I can't pick just four. It's kind of like eating a Reese's peanut butter cup. You know, you just can't stop at one. So it's, it's, 
any of the books. I, I love them. I love them all. They're all good books. It just depends. It depends on what you want to work on. Again, it depends on, are you needing to work on self-esteem? Then get the self-esteem workbook by Glenn Chiraldi. If you're having problems with boundaries and people pleasing, then get the disease to please by Harriet Breaker. If you're discovering that, oh my gosh, I'm missing a lot of my childhood. I don't remember it, but I know something happened then I would say uh, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk and The Inner Child Workbook by Katherine Taylor because it works on the physical stuff. If you've come out of an abusive relationship and they filled your head with all of this mean, nasty, vicious, not true lies, right? I would say CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. Those are all wonderful books. It just depends on what you want to focus on. What do you want to work on first? Really, what do you want to work on first? It's up to you. So that's what I would suggest. Uh, speaking of addiction, I have a totally bad social media addiction. It's basically impossible for me to go cold turkey because of work. What to do? Wow. Okay. So social media addiction is because it is stimulating the endorphins, dopamine, serotonins. We feel good, right? You get that like, or you get that thumbs up, or you get that, I don't even know, whatever the other platforms are but you get that positive reinforcement and the ego and the brain go oh this feels great let's just keep going and you suddenly somehow connect your worth to social media it does not mean that your worth is the same whether you're on social media or not so um if you're having to do it because of work i really strongly suggest that when you get off work you do not touch it you're done you're done for the day. You go be you in real world, real life with your partner or alone, whatever. Um, and you don't do it outside of work. You make it a work thing and that is it. Um, so, but it is addictive. It is. And there's so many, oh my gosh, especially younger people. So many younger people get their self-worth from social media and it's, it's an illusion. It's not true. Because it's it's changing all the time. One second they can love you and the next second they hate you. So it's kind of like, wow, you're going to live and die on this sword of social media? Wow, that's kind of painful and sucky. So you want to step away. You just want to step away. It's like when you're done with work, be done. And if you find yourself going, oh, but I need to find out what's going on, then you want to talk to a, a therapist. You do. And work on this addiction because it's not reality. So especially if we've been raised by narcissists, it's like that other esteem thing, other esteem, other esteem. Oh, it's, you know, other people like me, so I have worth. No, honey, you've got to love yourself 100%, 24 hours a day, no matter what, no matter what, no matter what. But with social media, it's always this give and take, you know, it's like here today, gone tomorrow. And that's exactly trauma bonding, trauma bonding, trauma bonding. Think about it. It's trauma bonding. So you may want to take a look at your family of origin. Why? Why are you addicted to social media? How did they groom you for that? Where did the trauma bonding first start? How did you pick this up? Why is this so intriguing to you? Why are you addicted to it? What's going on? Get with a good therapist. That's what I would recommend. Um, okay. After going no contact with my ex for five days, I feel like my body and mind are literally suffering. I begin therapy in two weeks to working on self-esteem, but I still feel lost. This is common. So remember, guys, when we leave an abuser, right, they've done this intermittent positive rewards, okay? It is the same thing as drugs, like <laughs> drugs. So we are addicted to the intermittent positive rewards. We are not addicted to the abuse. I want to make that perfectly clear because I've heard some people say, oh, you're addicted to the abuse. Yeah, fuck you. No, you're not. You're addicted to the intermittent positive rewards, just like a drug addict. So Meth heads, right? They would take methamphetamine and then they'd be chasing the dragon for the rest of the time period that they were in their thrall of addiction. And it's, you want that high. You want that, that love, that, you know, that incredible rush, that incredible dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine thing going on when they are good to you. So when we cut them off and we go cold turkey, goodbye, our brain is going to be like, but, 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 but where are they? Where are they? Where are they? What are they doing? Why are they, you know, why aren't they in the life? What's going on? And we'll have, we'll have drug dreams, you know, drug dreams being, we'll dream about them. You know, same thing with being a drug addict or an alcoholic. You will have drug and alcohol dreams. So our mind and body are literally going through detox, 
literally, because we were so used to that intermittent positive reward, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And our body is like, well, where is it? Where's, where's, where's the dopamine? Where's the serotonin? Where's this? Where's the that? And when they were good to us, oh my God, it was great. And when they were horrible, it was terrible, right? So we get addicted to that. We get addicted to those intermittent positive rewards. So yeah, you're going to feel lost. And when we come out of those relationships, we literally feel like not ourselves. Like, who am I? I don't even know who I am. I don't even know what I like. I have become somebody I do not recognize. That is what happens. Why? Because a lot of times in these abusive relationships, they're dictating to us who and what we are and what we like and where to go and what to wear and I'm telling us who we are. And it's a lie. They're lying to us. And so when we come out, we do feel lost. We absolutely do. I am thrilled that you are starting therapy in two weeks. Good job. Keep up with that. Don't stop. You are going to feel lost. Journal. Journal. Journal, 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 write it out, you know, write out every rotten thing they ever did to you. Because now in this time period, five days, that's nothing. That's the, not even the first week. Write out every rotten thing they did to you because the Hoover will happen. And especially because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Okay. So I've seen the pandemic Hoover. Oh, baby, baby, I've changed. Or, oh, it's, it's going to be different. Or I recognize, oh, somebody, somebody said this. I recognize I need to adapt. What? You're a fucking asshole. Fuck off. You don't need to adapt. You need to have a fucking frontal lobotomy, you asshole. Seriously. It's like they they say and do whatever they need to to get us to hook us back in, to make us go back to them. And they will be just horrible to us and lie to us in this very fragile time period. You know, you're, you're, you miss me. You need me. You need me. Um, I've changed. I'm different. I'm, I'm this, I'm that, you know, that whole thing. No, you don't need them. They haven't changed. They're not going to adapt. They don't care. They do not care. Again, you've got to remind yourself they have, we have no more meaning to them than the spray bottle. Seriously. So you're going to feel lost. Journal it out. What have they done to you? What have they said to you? What have they done to you? How did they hurt you? And put that somewhere where you can see it so that when the Hoover happens, not if, when, when the Hoover happens, you can remind yourself they did this, they did this, they did this, they did this, and they did this, and they harmed me. And that's not okay. So you're going to feel lost. It's going to happen. I'm glad you're in therapy. Go for it. Go for it. Do the best you can. You be you 110%. You start working on who you are. And it's okay to feel lost. Everyone does. When they come out of an abusive relationship, everyone feels lost. Everyone feels lost. Everyone does. We've lost who we are. We've lost our sense of self. We've lost our boundaries. We've lost respect. We've lost a whole bunch of stuff. So you journal it out. You write out every rotten thing that they did. And then you make sure you put it somewhere where you can see it so that when the Hoover happens, you can be like, not today, Satan, fuck off. Do you see where I'm going with that? So gentle with you, journal, journal, journal. If you have safe friends, not flying monkeys, okay, not people that are reporting back to your abuser, but safe friends that you can talk to and talk it out and grieve. Because remember, you're grieving. We're grieving the loss of the illusion of what we thought we had. And that is the hardest thing because that person is still alive, but we've lost that illusion of what we thought we had. So grieve, write a goodbye letter, write a grieving letter, write an angry letter, write out everything they did to you. Journal, 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 get it out of your head, get it onto paper, and then talk it out with your therapist. There you go. I hope that helps. Um, how do you spot a narcissist on social media? They're usually trolls. They're usually trolls. Um, also, they feel off. I don't know how to explain it, but it's like once they start talking, it's really weird. They just feel off. There's just something not right. So, yeah, you just trust your gut. Trust your gut, guys. It's really, I swear to God, the if you learn nothing else from all of this, it's to trust your own instincts. Trust your own intuition. That will tell you everything you need to know. So um, they're usually very uh, sneaky on social media on the, and this is something you guys need to be aware of, and I'm going to stop talking here pretty because I'm losing my voice, but um, you need to be aware of support groups, have a lot of trolls in them, a lot of narcissists in them. And so 
if they're wanting to hook up too fast, if they're wanting to know everything about you, but they're not telling you about them, if they're trolls, if they're snarky, if they're doing hit and run fuck yous, if they're like, you know, anything weird like that, be careful, be careful. And so just trust your gut. Trust your gut. Okay, I think that's going to be the last question for today. So remember, next week, no show. I am taking a break. Um, the week after, which I believe is the 16th, I think what I want to talk about is agoraphobia with post-traumatic stress disorder because a lot of us are terrified to leave our house or to go out or to just start dating again or do whatever. And, and so I want to talk about why. Why are we doing all of this? What does PTSD have to do with isolation. So we suddenly become our own abuser in a way and we start isolating. We don't leave the safety or comfort of our own home. So I want to talk about that. Okay, kids, have a wonderful day. Be good to each other. Remember, no show next week, but I will be coming back on the 16th, I believe. We'll be talking about agoraphobia and PTSD. All right, my loves, be good to each other. Have a great week and I'll talk to you later. Bye.